This is uh, flickering a little. I hope it. All right, should be good. <laughs> no? Should I just like? Can I do that without unplugging? Okay. I, I'm just not going to touch it, and it, it'll be fine. Um, we good? All right. <laughs> there you go. Um, all right, yeah, so uh, thanks to Boku for putting this on. This is a really awesome venue to, uh, to give a talk on, and I'm excited to close out the, uh, the first day of Backbone Comp Part 3. So uh, yeah, the title of the talk is, is Database JavaScript. And I sort of left the talk title a little, uh, a little vague just because I wasn't sure exactly uh, what all I was going to cover in this talk. Um, but I knew it was going to be data related. And it, it was sort of a play on, uh, uh, clicker does not work. Actually, sorry, one second. There we go. Uh, and it was a play on, uh, on database JavaScript. Uh, primarily because of a library that I've been working on for a little bit of time now, probably close to close to two years, um, which has pretty significant, I guess, like foundings in Backbone. Uh, and the library is called Bookshelf JS. And uh, I'm just curious, has anybody heard of uh, Bookshelf? Uh, okay, anybody using it for anything? Uh, all right, so some people, you know, it's still it's still young. But uh, basically, what it what it does is it is a uh, it, it models common relational patterns that you'd find uh, on the server side. So one to one, one to many, many to many uh, relationships between uh, between models in a relational database, and uh, it's really really heavily inspired by Backbone JS. So uh, when I say heavily inspired, I I actually took like the source of Backbone, I guess, and and copied it into another editor and just started ripping out the the different pieces that that didn't pertain to models and collections, like the view and the router. And then anywhere, is it still flickering? Uh, any, anywhere that, uh, that the, uh, where you would be hitting a RESTful API with, with like a uh, AJAX request with, with jQuery, uh, replaced it with, uh, with another library I've been working on called Connects.js. And Connects essentially tries to uh, pave over the different, uh, the different open source uh, databases that you'd find like MySQL, uh, SQLite, Postgres was sort of a common API. So in Node, there's not a, uh, a common way of dealing with these sorts of things. So each of these libraries have their own, uh, their own API and their own conventions for doing things. So this, is, this sort of tries to give you a, uh, a familiar uh, query building, sort of like a, a jQuery type syntax where it's connects select all from users, where the ID is in this list of IDs, and then you can do subqueries, and you can do joins, and pretty much anything you'd you'd want to do uh, with a relational database, you can hopefully do uh, with connects. So that's sort of the underlying layer of the of the bookshelf sort of higher layer that's uh, that's has its roots in Backbone. Um, and just an example of of how similar it looks that uh, once you initialize a, a bookshelf object with the connects object, you get bookshelf. So you model extend and Instead of a, uh, a URL, you have a table name, and then you can uh, add methods which, which sort of determine what the, what the different relations are. And then uh, here's an example of, of querying. Um, you create a site with ID of one, and then you do a fetch. So that would do like a select, all, or select one from site where ID is one, and then you can fetch based on those relations, and it sort of loads everything as you, as you would need. Um, and so the idea here, it, it was first, it, there are two, two sorts of things. One was that I've been working with JavaScript, and I, I liked working with relational databases, but it, it uh, didn't seem like there were that many good options in, in Node. Uh, so I thought maybe it would be fun to, uh, to try, and, try and build one, I guess, so that I could work with, uh, with patterns that I liked from, from uh, Backbone with the models and collections, but on the server side with, with Node.js. Uh, and, and the other one was sort of to see if I could push Backbone to this, to this holy grail uh, sorts of, sort of thing. Um, and everybody knows that the, the holy grail of, of JavaScript apps is, uh, is to-do lists. Uh, so so, um, 
So, you know, like all, all, the, all the good, like once you've made a to-do list app in your framework, then you know you've made it. Um, so I've actually never published this because I was afraid that someone might think it was a good idea to, to do this, but I was able to successfully uh, switch out uh, Bookshelf for Backbone Models collections and have the to-do list actually work from, from so I wrote it from like the to-do MVC and uh, was able to switch it out with web SQL as the as the back end and it worked but yeah I was just afraid like don't ever do this because uh, like web SQL is deprecated so it's just a bad idea in general but it was sort of a cool proof of concept um, but the real holy grail is is to be able to reuse uh, reuse code on the on the client and the server and so I thought that maybe by by sort of combining sort of some of the ideas from Backbone that I'd be able to do that, reuse the collections and the models on the, on the client and the server. And I think this is still something that, that's, it's not as easy as it sounds. Like, that you can't just, uh, you can reuse some little bits of things, but there's, there's discrepancies here and there, and it's, it's not as easy as reusing the, uh, the same API. Um, and so, so one thing, I, I've given a few talks on these libraries before, and, uh, and honestly, like, talking about relational databases in JavaScript is, to me, incredibly boring, um, just because there, like, there's two, I guess, probably two groups of, of people that would attend a conference like Backbone, and either you've worked in a server-side scripting language where you have you know, that's, that's more established, that didn't grow up like right alongside Mongo, and where you have actual relational database abstractions that are pretty well built out. And so if that's the case, then the talk can, can sort of be summed up in like, this is trying to do that, but it's probably not quite there yet um, in, in JavaScript. And, uh, and so, and if you haven't done that, like if you haven't, uh, if, if you're not, if you're more of a client side developer and you, and you just work on the front end, then the last place that you're going to want to learn SQL is at like the last talk of the day at Backbone Comp. Um, so I, I just figured that maybe I wouldn't talk about this as much. I, I'd sort of give a high level overview, um, but if you if you want to find out more, there's recorded talks uh, where I sort of do a deep dive uh, into the API. And I think there's also still sort of a lot of work to be done. So um, have created this thing and, and people are using it and now that you're s sort of starting to hammer on a little bit and see where the weaknesses are and so uh, you know what I was what I was thinking was maybe um, maybe I could take some of these ideas uh, the shortcomings that I've found either from from the uh, the bookshelf ORM that I've been working with or some things in some applications that I've been working on more recently in backbone and see if I could sort of share some of those ideas and then maybe see if there's anything that, that might, might come of that. Uh, so I'm going to jump back to the, the original title of just, uh, just database JavaScript. Um, and this is the second, uh, second talk in a row with the Swiss Army Knife. And I love Swiss Army Knives. They're so cool. Uh, so, so we're, we're going to talk about the, the Swiss Army Knife of, of uh, application data with, in, in Backbone, which are, which are the models and collections. Um, and, and sort of some context of, of where I'm coming from and, and the projects that, that I've been working on recently. Uh, I work for a, a company and we build software for people to go in and do home energy efficiency audits uh, in homes to sort of take a whole bunch of calculations, hundreds of, of very specific uh, measurements about a home uh, dealing with different things and run it through a modeling engine and then try to figure out what the uh, the savings investment ratio is, what the sort of ROI is on uh, on different upgrades to the home. And in, in doing this, our application has has hundreds of fields which are all sort of dependent on one another uh, that like when one changes, then they uh, then all the others might change, and they're pulling data from all these different sources, and there's so many, uh, there's just a, a mess of just different things that have to interact with each other, and everything is is live, so it's socket I.O., so you've got like hundreds and hundreds of fields that are all sort of talking to each other, they're all database driven, and they, they're sort of tough to deal with, so you've got a lot of models updating all the time, and then to top it off, uh, we have to be offline uh, pretty soon, at least for, for the basic uh, data input. So we're sort of pushing, pushing a lot of the limits of, of backbone models and collections, uh, especially with 
uh, network connectivity and, and offline first was a talk from earlier today. Uh, and so I just wanted to share some, some sort of things that, things that I've observed in, in building this application and in book, building Bookshelf uh, about the models and collections and, and you know, see, see where, where that might go. Um, and so these are just opinions, so take them with a grain of salt. But uh, it, it, in my experience, backbone models and collections, I think, do, do a little too much. Um, but by themselves, they, they aren't enough alone. And, and this is just in the context of, of what I've been working on. And then the, uh, the, the final opinion is that there's, there's better ways than listening to individual state change events on, on models and collections all, all across your application. Um, and I did a Google image search for heresy because I know this is just like not, th this goes against the core tenets of, of Backbone in general. Um, so I'll try to defend them a little bit and, and also note that these might not apply in all cases. Uh, so the first point is that is that they do too much, and and I know, it's it's like how how is that the case? You know, there's only a couple hundred lines of code, you know, all together for for uh, for the models and collections. Um, so I, I think they might they might do too much. Like for example, uh, for, from the the last talk, it sounded like backbone models and collections fit the fit the API that, that you would be working against with WordPress so well that it, it it's a perfect match. Um, but but sometimes I think if you if you're trying to push the envelope a little bit, uh, they they might do a little too much. Uh, so if we look at, at backbone models and collections and, and what they do, they they wrap data and they do validations, uh, yeah, change notification, uh, and then relations. It sort of gets a little fuzzy around there because there's no best practice around how to deal with related data. I think in the documentation it actually says that you can sort of nest, nest uh, related data as attributes on the model or collection. Uh, it, it deals with syncing sort of directly. So uh, if you have the same, the same model multiple places, it, it could be hitting the same API at different times. And it, it can be uh, difficult, I guess, um, just that the model is very, very tied to, uh, to the change. And uh, it's also the place for your app-specific logic. So it's really easy to, to bog that down uh, by putting too much on the model that doesn't necessarily belong there. And then uh, the, the collections, they, they wrap the models, uh, which is great. But they also have very tight ties with the models. Like the, the model's URL is driven on, on the collection. So there's a direct reference there. Um, and maybe you have nested models, or, or it, there's, it's sort of up in the air how you should structure your, your models and collections. Um, and in my mind, what, what they should do, or, or what in, in our case they've been better suited to do, I guess, is for the models to just wrap data uh, and deal with getting setting, um, to have limited ch change notification, and, uh, and to also return sort of external relations based on based on the attributes. So they don't actually store them, but based on what the ID or what other properties of the model are, you can you can return uh, these external things. And then all the collections do for us is is to just filter the models uh, straight up. So there's we stripped out a whole bunch of the uh, the functionality there. So just going to talk, talk really quickly about so, some of the difficulties uh, that, that I've had personally with, with collections uh, when working, uh, especially with, with uh, Bookshelf.js. And uh, the first is that, that collections, and we've seen this code from earlier today with, with Jeremy's great walkthrough, but uh, the, they have a API very similar to, to JavaScript arrays. So they're very array-like, length, pop, push, shift, uh, all, all the familiar ones. Um, but they're actually, they're actually from the documentation we see that they're ordered sets. Um, so they're, they're not actually arrays, they're, there's only really one of a particular model. Um, but internally they're, they're set up like maps uh, and you know, they're indexed by ID. And so th this sort of gets a little tricky uh, when you get to collection.set. Uh, sometimes if you have a lot of different data changing and coming in from different sources, it can be hard to reconcile what, as the models are, are coming in, and what should what should do what at a certain uh, point in time. Um, and I, yeah, I couldn't fit all the uh, the code on one screen, but luckily we got it broken into three screens uh, earlier today. Um, so that's sort of a summary of that. The uh, and then I'm also thinking 
they don't only do too much, but they also might not be enough um, by themselves. So it's easy to have multiple sources of truth. So the idea, the fundamental idea behind Backbone is that you don't want to be serializing state in the DOM. You know, like think about jQuery where you have a class that's named user logged in and that's how you used to check for whether a user was logged in or not. And so in all your places you had to make sure that that class wasn't being accidentally set incorrectly. Um, and I think, so Backbone tries to push that up a layer by putting it on the, uh, on the, by having models and collections and the views responding to, uh, to state change. But then if you have, let's say, a logged in user and then also a user that's nested at some point inside a collection response uh, for maybe you have like a post with many comments and a user is one of the people that made one of those comments and you have two sort of sources of, of the user uh, instance in, in different locations. If one is updated, the other the other doesn't know about that. And uh, and while you maybe you shouldn't shouldn't be doing that, I've seen it happen in in a lot of cases, and it's difficult to come up with a solution uh, that's elegant, I guess, on your own. Um, so that's that's as I mentioned, the uh, the object identity issues is is similar. That maybe or maybe you go the the other way where you are referencing the same user. Uh, from multiple places, and then you don't actually want the same user object that you're maybe mutating some uh, some attributes on that that aren't actually the attributes is the wrong word, but you're just sort of uh, fiddling with this model, and it's supposed to be behave it's supposed to be a different instance than this other one, but it's the same because you wanted to make sure that we solved the the other problem, and you can run into some issues there, um, and and really it just boils down to that there's no definitive place of, of knowing uh, what data exists in your application. Like uh, in our case, models, there were so many different models that dealt with one another uh, that changes were, were sort of passing through and it was very difficult without sort of a, a predefined, um, predefined space to, to deal with all this. Uh, how, how, would you, how would you know what's actually in your app at one time without, you know, globals? So better than change events, uh, better better solution. I, I don't know about this one. Um, just that if you think about it, maybe there's a better way than having each view just very tightly coupled with with an individual model, and that it's listening on its change events, and you have all these little pieces around your app where you're where you're listening on change events. It's it can be difficult to visualize when a change occurs, what actually is going to happen along the line. I think that's one of the, one of the problem with, uh, with change event listeners. So I'm sort of grilling on, uh, on backbone models and collections, but I, I don't think that, uh, I think that there, there might be a, a solution to this. Um, so what might an elegant solution look like? Because uh, if we look at sort of more monolithic uh, libraries like Ember Data, which, you know, has very opinionated uh, approach to, to how your data should be structured and how it's uh, synced and, and everything like that, that wouldn't really be the, the backbone approach. Um, so, so let's talk about maybe some of the things that you could do to, to limit the scope of, of uh, data. Uh, so yeah, so first it, it would limit the scope of models and collections, sort of have them, have them do a little less, push some of, the, uh, some of the bigger methods that had to be split into, into multiple slides from, from the, uh, the keynote from today into maybe, maybe some of that belongs in a, in a uh, different location. Um, pave over some of, the, some of the complexities, like I mentioned, the, the collection.set, it can sort of be a black box and you're not really sure what's, what's going on in there. And also just simplify listening to, to change over time. So if you have multiple models that are talking independently to, to a back-end store, uh, you know, posting, and, but they somehow depend on one another. There's no real good way uh, without just binding, binding listeners to, to models and collections, which you really don't want to be doing, uh, to know what the state of your app is. Every, everything sort of knows about its own little, little view of the world in your application. And, and sometimes that can be, that can be great uh, when you're hitting external APIs, like I said from the last presentation, but sometimes when you have a, a, uh, an application like the one I, I'd mentioned working on, you, you have to really know what's going on with everything and, and how that works. So in, in my mind, what this would look like is, is having sort of a backbone dot session, uh, where it's just a, a single, single store, so you can, 
you can you can think of it sort of like a uh, is it is it still flickering or I think I think my uh, I think I dropped my computer once and it, it uh, <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah. what's it so so anyway as as uh, Adam's fixing it uh, <laughs> Uh, the 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 backbone dot session you can think of it sort of like a session cookie where it's it's something that's very uh, very temporary um, it would only live until the application is is refreshed essentially and uh, and it would also be similar to to backbone dot sync where everything sort of pipes through one one individual source in the app so every every change that happens would go back through the backbone dot session and then and then come full circle back out to the to the models and collections, um, and in order for that to work, the the models and collections would have to would have to in turn reference back to that to that backbone session. So it'd sort of be like the single source of truth, the true single source of truth, I guess you could say, for your application. Um, and and this is the pro the approach that we that we ended up ended up using and I'm going to sort of talk about just a few of the of the different pieces that, that go into that and then uh, see uh, see what anybody thinks. So uh, we have a, a get path method and the get path method essentially uh, it's similar to the URL where the URL defines like a, a universal resource locator for for what endpoint it's hitting. Uh, the, the get path returns into this into this uh, I don't know. Uh, into this uh, root root data store, where where the uh, the attributes that it's referencing uh, actually live. So in this case, it would be for, from the root. It would be accounts and then ID. And in this case, so it doesn't necessarily have to be flat. So you could also sort of group things by the indexes that make the most sense uh, to to. Sh should I just? Uh, All right, hopefully that's better. <laughs> yes! No. Uh, all right. Well, there's only a few more minutes and then we're done. So, um, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so it doesn't have to be the, uh, it doesn't have to be flat. You can, you can index things by what makes the most sense, I guess, uh, based on how you're working in your application. So for example, you're, you're never really going to look up a, a post if it, if it lives inside a site, then you're only ever going to look it up inside that site. Or if you have a, a comment uh, that lives by a post, you're, you're never going to look up the comment by its primary key because there's no, no place you're really going to know that. Um, and, and if that is a common pattern, you can sort of have that indexed and, and what I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? Well, I'm holding it, it doesn't flicker. Okay, turn off mirroring. Turn off mirroring? Oh, you know what? Oh, take, I'm not down. Take, your resolution. take my resolution down? Oh, I could kill that too. Yeah, I think that's people, it. A lot of people are talking. Those are the top two candidates are the, the remote and taking on the res. All right. But you use the no, it's no jerk. Huh? Yeah, just uh, yeah, take it down to eight hundred. All right, eight hundred to get eight hundred to res. That means each pixel is one is six inches. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see where where I was. I'm sorry. Oh no worries. All right, thanks for th thanks for bearing with this. Hopefully it uh, hopefully we make it through. Um, okay, so so yeah, like I said, you can so the, when you're when you're getting JSON responses back from the server, it, it typically 
looks like this. So it, it, it makes a lot of sense to, to just sort of throw it in collection um, in a similar fashion. Uh, but in our, in our experience for, for the stuff that we were doing, it, it was more efficient to, to already sort of pre-index what, what the lookup path is based on the, the, uh, the foreign keys that, that sort of makes sense. Uh, and this ended up being that you know, if you change something in this path, you can then hit the server with, with that path and then have it go through the socket IO and it knows exactly into the root session layer um, what, what individual model needs to change. And so it doesn't have to look through the collection and then find it and, and look it up and, and update it that way. So it's just uh, really straightforward to see see as things are, are coming in. Um, so just something to, to consider, I guess you could say. Uh, and then in our case, relations uh, were dealt with. So uh, a post has many comments in, in a lot of cases where commenting is enabled on blogs. And, uh, and so you could say that it, it's, it's typically based on the post ID. So on the post object, you would return a collection where the uh, where you'd look into the into the root session and say get in uh, comments and then and then ID, and then the way that that setting attributes would work it, it from the from the end user's perspective you know from the backbone developer's perspective it it wouldn't have any change really you would just call model dot set but internally it would be calling model dot session set in and then whatever the, the path is with the attribute that you're adding sort of tacked on, concatted onto, onto the end, and then uh, with the value. And so then it would sort of go back into the, into the root layer and, and refresh you know, the different views that, that have that path, um, as well as it would be sort of the single source where we would have it go to our, our socket IO layer, or it could be Ajax, depending on, on uh, which piece of data we were dealing with. But instead of having it go directly from the model to the sink, it was all coming back into one place. So we could know that you know, if something was, if there were multiple models that had to be set at the same time, like s certain values that we could have one place that we were looking at that. You could do the same with sync, but you, the, you sort of lose a little bit when you don't have the full state of the world snapshot uh, there, sort of at your fingertips. Um, so, so what this what this ended up gaining us was it just dr drastically simplified collections. And and I was sort of going through the backbone source, seeing where you know if if there were a a. Uh, a store that, that dealt with a lot of a lot of the things that are dealt with in uh, in backbone collections uh, set method, what that would sort of gain, and and it ended up stripping out a lot of code. Um, I, I I didn't get it all quite working, but but it seemed uh, it seemed pretty significant what all uh, what all it was taking out. And really, I think the the best thing about it was that just that it was really easy to reason about. If you have the entire state of the world of your application in one in one place, you can just sort of look at what everything is, and as changes are coming in, you can, you know, to to Jeremy's point earlier about the the changes being synchronous in Backbone and how that's really easy to reason about because you don't have to worry about the fact that uh, something you, you set something and the value might not be uh, set on the next line. Uh, it's it's really easy to sort of see when it's coming in, where it's going, and just have everything um, everything going through a single source of truth. And then it, it, it's also been pretty easy. We're, we haven't gotten quite there yet with the full application, um, but to sort of flip that bit into offline mode to, uh, you know, when the when the socket goes goes offline, we have one place uh, that, that we need to deal with that. And we also know what the state of the world is. So when we need to go into um, when we need to serialize the entire application and store it in local storage, we can just do that. Um, and we are looking into into uh, PouchDB a little bit, so the uh, the hoodie uh, presentation is pretty cool today. But uh, but it, it makes it a lot easier to uh, to reason about. So sort of something that's it's very simple for for Backbone, I guess, that acts similar to. To sort of a central source of truth, like what what we heard earlier today with the uh, with the hoodie application. So I, I sort of picked out just a few a few little bits of code just to take a quick look at um, that that 
might illustrate some of these points. Uh, I didn't quite get it working into a full Backbone plugin yet. Uh, it's sort of been uh, tricky to strip out what's not application specific. Um, but but this is sort of what the what the different methods would look like. Uh, similar, like a mix in similar to to the way that the events work. Like this is something you would mix into the prototype for the uh, for the collection or for the model. Um, and so you have you can sort of create a reference between this this root session and it, it essentially proxies all the events and and passes them through to the to the model and collection, um, which which it's it's sort of. Uh, Acting, the I guess the the models and collections backbone in this in this instance become more of like a proxy where they have application specific methods, but they aren't the aren't the actual data. So the attributes um, are are living somewhere else unless you end up calling uh, deref. So if you want to, let's say you have a a uh, user and you're editing their username. But you don't want that username to actually change in the root until you've hit submit. You can sort of cut it, cut its ties with the with the root session that you're dealing with, and and edit it locally, and then and then maybe uh, save it and sync it with the uh, with with the root session uh, after that. And so this is sort of a, a little bit of what the model looks like. Again, uh, I'm not sure if this is all entirely correct. Uh, it's it's quite close, but. Um, Sort of just pulled out a few specific bits of code, uh, but the the idea is that when uh, when the model's constructed, it sort of figures out based on the based on the path what it's what it's supposed to look like, um, and so you mix in the session methods, and then the same thing would would happen with the uh, with the collection, and then uh, this is sort of a, sh a very stripped down version. But it, I guess w the point that I'm trying to make with this is that it really doesn't have to be some some complex monolithic, uh, almost just entire data layer that you're dealing with. Like it doesn't even have to know about, about how changes are synced or anything. It just seems like it might be a good idea, or it could be a good idea, I guess. I, I'm sort of opening the, the conversation. I want to hear what others think, because uh, if anyone else has hit this problem, you know, maybe, maybe it would make a good plug-in, or maybe it's just me. I, I, I don't know. Um, so this is just a, a, a stripped down example of, of what, the, uh, what the session would look like. And it would have individual models, which would only act for, for holding the attributes uh, temporarily. So uh, looking beyond uh, backbone models and collections, I, I mentioned this in the, in the talk. Uh, so I, in the talk, little little uh, snippet. So I figured I'd just mention it really quick. But a, a library that, that has come out recently that I think is, is really uh, worth taking a look at, uh, it's, it's pretty cool, is Immutable.js by, by Facebook. And what Immutable gives you is essentially persistent data structures in, in JavaScript. So uh, what, what it provides is that uh, think about how often you need to defensively clone or extend empty object uh, whatever in in JavaScript uh, because you don't want to be mutating values as they come in. Uh, immutable essentially gives you data structures similar to like ES6 map and and it gives you a list which is an array like and it gives you a set and as you make changes it it doesn't actually mutate the value that you're working with but it instead returns a uh, a new value but it shares sort of some of the structure with the old value so it's it's more efficient than doing like a clone or a uh, or a deep clone um, so here we can see in the example it's like x dot set a uh, uh, sorry um, get a one and then y is one as well but then x b is undefined but then uh, I don't even know if I have this right well it should be Y. The last line should definitely be Y because that would be a bug if it was not. Um, <laughs> so you know, I, I try. Uh, so so the the takeaway points I guess from the talk was that if if you like Node um, but want to want to use more relational databases uh, than than just Mongo, uh, take a look at, at Connects and Bookshelf, uh, actively being being developed by me and uh, and some other uh, maintainers and. Um, I'm excited about it. 
And you know, maybe maybe backbone.session could be a thing. I don't know. Uh, it's definitely something that I've realized that not having a single source of truth for at least the models and collections in in the uh, in the database library uh, can really can really hurt you. Um, so so maybe that's the same on the client in some cases. I'm interested to to hear what others think on that. Uh, or or maybe it, it could be ampersand.session. I don't know. Uh, we'll find out more about that tomorrow. I think, um, but. The, the the main point of the talk, I guess, was just to to really critically like spend time and critically think about how data uh, flows throughout your application because time spent on that can really save you a lot of uh, a lot of time and headaches in the long run, um, and uh, that's that's about everything.